So just two quick announcements that I neglected to make during the announcement period, um, and I think the first one is, is an important one for us. Um, we've been uh, offering opportunities for the men of the parish to, to get together. We had a lunch uh, last Tuesday at the Alibi for any interested people, and this coming Tuesday at 9 a.m. for anyone that's interested, um, we're creating an opportunity for the men of the parish to come to get to know each other and to share a time of fellowship. There'll be coffee in the Lloyd Cracknell room, and you're more than welcome to come to that. The other announcement is just to let you know that Father Matt is not with us today. Uh, he is in the Diocese of Toronto at a parish, um, checking out the parish to see if from his perspective it might possibly be a good fit for him. Um, and so I would ask all of you, as Matt continues to discern what his future is uh, God's calling him to, keep him in your prayers as we do that. At our vestry meeting, we'll have a bit more of an update um, from Father Matt on, on where things are for him. So. The latest statistics have come in, and it's not looking good. And it's something that many of us this past year know all too well. And what I'm talking about is there is a report that has been prepared for the Anglican Church of Canada's House of Bishops, and it offers a fairly grim projection of the future of our beloved Anglican Church. According to this report, if the membership continues to decline, we can expect to turn the lights out by the year 2040. And I'm not talking just one congregation, the report is talking about the Anglican Church of Canada as a whole. Between 2001 and 2017, membership in the church dropped by 44%. In my nearly 18 years serving as a priest, I have had to attend more deconsecrations of church buildings than I would like to admit. And I have had the opportunity, the misfortune of being directly involved in two church closings in a parish that I have been directly serving. And many of us know and have experienced firsthand the grief and the sorrow that goes along with closing a church that we love. I am not going to stand up here and tell you that these numbers that have been presented in this report, I'm not going to stand up and say that these are not a cause for concern. But when it comes right down to it, there are two responses that we can have to this information. We can choose to fall into a spirit of despair. We can choose to despair over the numbers that we are seeing. We can start to plan the funeral for the Anglican Church of Canada. Or we can choose another way. We can commit ourselves and we can choose to be a people who live with hope. We can choose to be a people who live with hope. To trust that even in the darkest moments, God will be faithful in coming to us. God will be faithful in being present to us. And God will be faithful in leading us into new life. What the future holds may mean that the Anglican Church that we all love so much may not look the same as it does today. But God will be faithful in making sure that the gospel of his son, the gospel of love, is proclaimed into the world. This is what is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian community. We are a people gathered together, together through the waters of baptism. We are a people who live with hope. Next week, is the beginning of a new liturgical year. We find ourselves in launching into the season of Advent. 
And Advent is one of those seasons in the church year where, with intention, we adopt a posture of hope. During the season of Advent, we are encouraged to stand in the darkness, waiting with hopeful expectation for a light to come to us and to shine in the darkness. And at Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus is that light. Jesus is the light of the world, and he is the source of our hope. So again, two responses we can make. We can choose to despair over the fact that our church is in decline. And we can choose to lament all of the challenges that go along with that. Or we can adopt a posture of hope. Choose to place our hope in Jesus and to celebrate the signs of new life that are all around us, even in the midst of our current struggles. Our old parish does not look like it did earlier in the year. We no longer have two church buildings that we call home. We have one. We can choose to despair over that, or we can choose to celebrate the joy and the energy that comes from being blessed with the opportunity to be a people who worship and minister together. There is an energy in this place since September that brings joy and excitement and hope, and I give thanks to God for that. Now, Jenny Anderson, a suffragan bishop in Toronto. She offered some thoughts in response to this report. She says, and I agree with her, that the kind of growth that should be of ultimate concern for the church is not something you can measure. It is not something that you can plot on a graph or see on a budget. Are people growing in their love for Jesus? Are lives being changed to live into the way of Jesus? Are people deepening their commitment to prayer and to the way of love and service? These are the kinds of things that can't be measured. But if people are maturing in their Christian faith, that is the growth that should be of ultimate importance to us. Now the other observation that Jenny made in her response, she acknowledged, and I think it's important for us to always keep in mind, this church that we love so much, this church has always been one generation away from extinction. And so the situation that we find ourselves in, no matter how hard we try to convince ourselves that this is the worst time to be the church, this situation is not unique to the church. Each generation, each generation of the church needs to ask itself, how are we going to share with people who have never heard it starting with our own children and our own grand grandchildren, how are we going to share with people the good news that we ourselves have come to know in Jesus Christ? Today is the last day of the church year. And on this day, I've already said, we celebrate the reign of Christ. And yet, the gospel reading that is appointed for our celebration of the reign of Christ it's the story of Jesus' death on the cross. But I think that speaks a word of hope into what we are experiencing as an institutional church. And for some of us, I hope and pray that it speaks a word of hope to us into whatever it is we are going through in our own lives at this very moment. And that word of hope is this. God's saving love is made known in Jesus. 
God's saving love is made known in Jesus and reigns over all things and all circumstances. That God's saving love reigns over even death itself. Because although today we see Jesus in his suffering and hanging on a tree, although today we know that in this story of Jesus, his life, although today we know that death is so very near for him, we also know, as Paul Harvey used to say, we know the rest of the story. We know that even in death, God brings new life. Even in the face of death, we live with hope because we are a resurrection people. Even at the grave, we make our song. We sing out our alleluias because our trust and our hope is in Christ. We are an Easter morning kind of people. We are an empty tomb kind of people. In all things, in all circumstances, we are able to live with hope because the love of God reigns and has been made known to us in and through Jesus. Now I want to switch gears a little bit. It is interesting in Luke's telling of the story about Jesus' death that we just heard that Luke really seems to want to stress to his readers that even though Jesus is being crucified, something that is done to criminals in his day, Luke wants people to know that Jesus is an innocent man. Think about what the repentant criminal said to the other one who kept taunting and deriding Jesus. He said, knock it off. We have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, this Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And if we had read more of the story this morning, Luke gets even more direct, as the Roman centurion who's guarding Jesus, after witnessing his death, declares, certainly this man was innocent. Now here's what's interesting about that. That's not what Matthew or Mark have the centurion saying in their versions of Jesus' death. In Matthew and Mark, the centurion says, Truly this man was God's son. For some reason, it was more important to Luke to stress the importance of Jesus' innocence than it was to make a statement about Jesus being the Son of God. And so we have to ask ourselves, why was it more important for Luke to stress Jesus' innocence rather than state unequivocally that he is the Son of God? Maybe the reason Luke keeps reminding us about his innocence is to make the story of his death seem even more tragic. It's one thing for a criminal to die on a cross. It's another story altogether for an innocent man to suffer that fate. But I think there's more to it than that. What if the reason why Luke wants to stress Jesus' innocence so much is to remind us that this Jesus in whom we have placed our hope is one who stands in solidarity with all of the innocent victims in our world. Stands with the vulnerable because he himself was vulnerable. Stands with the forgotten and all those who suffer injustice because he himself suffered injustice. And then when he is raised to new life on Easter morning, Hope is resurrected in the lives of all of the innocents, of all who he stands in solidarity with. And it's a, this is all a good reminder for us today as we prepare to take a first look at the budget that will ultimately shape the mission and ministry that we as a Paris family feel called to support in the coming year through the giving of our money, through the giving of our time, through the sharing of our talents. Because as followers of Jesus, as people who proclaim that Christ is our King, 
We are a people who are committed to letting God's reign, love reign in our lives. We are called to be a symbol of hope for the world. We are called to embody that saving love. We are called to stand in solidarity with the weak, the oppressed, the forgotten of this world, so that they too might know that God's love reigns even over their own circumstances. And so as we look at our budget for the coming year, we're encouraged to reflect on in what ways are we committed to doing that. Now I've said this before, but sometimes when it comes to budgets, when it comes to simply looking at the numbers on a page, it doesn't do a very good job of telling that story of all the love that has been poured out by this community because we have said yes to a financial budget. I want to share with you the ministry that was made possible in this place just over this past week. Because we said yes to a budget, because we committed ourselves to being generous in the giving of our money, and our time and our talents in serving this church. We were blessed to be able to pour out God's love on people's lives in so many different ways. A homeless man came to the door earlier in the week, was able to sit and talk with him about the struggles that he's having. Could have simply handed him a gift card and sent him on his way. But because this building exists, because this community supports the, the, uh, the presence of, of a priest in this community throughout the week, was able to sit and listen to that man's story, to reflect back to him God's love and to respect the dignity of that human being. And then, yes, was able to send him on his way with something to be able to get him a hot meal was able to extend to him an invitation, inviting him back to be able to go with me to buy him a pair of boots for the winter months because he was walking around with toes sticking through his shoes. That's just one person. Later in the week, I was able to uh, sit with, with uh, uh, two children, 19 and 20, whose father dropped out of a heart attack this week. Was able to sit with them in their grief was able to pour out God's love on them in their lives, was able to talk with them about the hope that we place in Jesus, that death doesn't get the last word. We gathered together yesterday for the opportunity to, to, to celebrate that man's life, to celebrate the Christian hope. That is possible because this community is generous in the giving of their money, their time, and their talents to live collectively the way of Jesus Christ. When I go off and I do those things, I do not do it on my own. The whole community is with me. Also this week, we were able to bless, to be able to celebrate the blessing of the sacrament of marriage between two individuals who have been together for a long time and love themselves so very, very much. We were able to pour out God's love and to show them that Christ's reign is with them, even in the midst of all of the celebrations of their lives. And we were able to do that because this building exists. We were able to do that because we have a chancel guild who prepares the space for worship. We were able to do all of that because we are generous in the giving of our time, our talent, and our treasure. So many things happen in this place that reflect and pour out the love of Christ. There was a piano recital here yesterday where people were invited to share the gifts that God blessed them with. That's possible because of our time, our talent, and our treasure. We have a nearly new shop. We now have a breakfast program. We have a growing men's group that we gather together. We just had a successful ACW, our crisp parish bazaar. Uh, most parishes, it's a lot of ACW, but for us, it's a whole parish. All of these things, every single one of them, is because we are generous in the giving of our time, our talents, and our treasure, and because we are a people who seek to follow the way of Jesus. And so when we gather together downstairs today, when we look over the financial numbers, it's not just numbers on a page. It's not simply paying hydro 
and insurance and apportionment and salaries and all those other things that are required of us to do. Because we do those things, we are a community who has said yes to living with hope. We are a community who has said yes, that we are going to proclaim that Christ's love reigns in all circumstances. And for that I say, thanks be to God.